Hello. Our story begins inside the Death Star. Princess Leia of Alderaan was brought on board to be interrogated for her escape from the Battle of Scarif. Her vessel was intercepted over Tatooine, and Darth Vader was eager to learn of where these plans for the Death Star went. Galen Erso had apparently created a flaw in the system, and the Empire was actively tracking them down to make sure the Alliance couldn't exploit such a flaw. With the Imperial Senate being dissolved hours after Vader's arrival, the super weapon, there was no one left to stop the Empire, aside from the insignificant rebellion that continued knocking on their doorstep. Princess Leia was tied to it, and Lord Vader was left to oversee the torture and release of the information she had. He was a masterful torturer. Everyone he interacted with gave him the information the moment he wanted it. However, he knew with Leia that this task would be especially tedious. She was strong-headed, and she didn't take anything from anyone. She wouldn't stand for it, and her stubbornness would make her difficult for Vader. He knew this just from their short interactions at the Tent of Four. The fact that she was seen literally leaving the Battle of Scarif, and then defended the idea that she was on a diplomatic mission was honestly amusing in Vader's mind. It was annoying because he'd had to force her to give over answers, but the entire idea of her saying what she just said was kind of funny. Vader started with simple torture techniques, things the Empire had been using since the end of the Republic era, methods that were considered unethical in the minds and eyes of the Republic Senate. In the era of Empire, torture became much more drastic. It was vicious, and it had one destination, success. Though most of the success came at the expense of the prisoner or the person who was unlucky enough to fall into imperial hands. The Empire used these tactics against citizens for simple bartering or on public officials for simplicities like trade disputes. As rebellion grew over the years, it was used during uprisings on Ferrix and Lethal, though its effectiveness was beginning to feel as if it were flawed. The difference, the Empire noted, between citizens and rebels is that these rebels wouldn't sell out their allies. They died for their cause, they fought for their cause, and if it meant coming down to the better end, they would die. The ideals of the rebellion may have been established in hope, but as was said by the earliest leaders or voices of the Alliance, that their fight was a future they knew they wouldn't see. Their fight wasn't just for themselves, but for everyone. Stand up together, fight together, and fight the Empire. All messages shared by young and old, Ezra Bridger of Lothal and Marva Karasi and Dwarf Ferrix. Vader wasn't going to be patient with this. Did he care for the technological terror that was a Death Star? No, of course not. It was insignificant next to the power of the Force. However, Vader had to play nice because Palpatine's good friend and longtime ally seized control over the Death Star, and Tarkin had far too much influence within the Empire for Vader to be testy with him. If he wanted things to go over nicely, then he would have to play this game. The first trials of the interrogation went by very slowly and ineffectively. Nothing the droids could do would break through her mind. She was like a steel trap, and while Vader didn't know it, this woman was the same little girl who resisted an Inquisitor in her youth. A puny little droid wouldn't be anything to convince her to spew out information about the Rebel Alliance. Tarkin was preparing an alternative strategy for coaxing information out of her. The Death Star was en route to Alderaan so that they may blow the planet into oblivion. While Palpatine would never openly support this move, Tarkin didn't care. He wanted to destroy the Alliance once and for all, even if it meant costing himself a role next to his Emperor. Vader walked into Leia's prison cell and sat down across from her, telling her that this wasn't going to go over well for her. She had one more chance to give over the location of the Death Star plans. Truthfully, she didn't know, but when she resisted, she was forced to undergo incredible pain. Vader raised his hand to her head and used the Force, reaching into her mind. Leia's mind was still a trap, one that forced Vader to struggle to get into it. He couldn't see in for some reason, but with all of this training and understanding of the Force, he was able to slowly pry into her mind, opening it up and learning more than he could have ever imagined. He could see familiar faces, but there was a blurring aura around each of them. He slowly revealed it. He could see Bale and Brea on Alderaan. He could see Ezra and Kanan Lothal. He could see Obi-Wan and her on Jabim. It didn't stop there, though. He continued backwards, further and further, and then he stopped. He couldn't believe his eyes, and then he was pulled back, the shock forcing him to break free. Leia was inside of his mind too. Not intentionally, but he opened himself up to her by going into her mind. She didn't see much but darkness, however, she felt some sort of connection to him and didn't understand it. Nothing about any of this made any sense, but he stormed out of the room. She watched the door close behind him and laid back down. She felt so much pain from the torture droids that she needed to rest. But when she closed her eyes, she was dragged into a vision of something she could never recognize. Vader, on the other hand, felt some sort of connection and marched his way through the hallways. He told two stormtroopers to stay put, not to open the door unless directly ordered to from him. The troopers nodded their heads as Vader marched down the hall. He got to his quarters, which wasn't too far away from the detention area, and walked in. He closed his eyes and felt through the force once more, going back to what he saw inside of Leia's mind. 
and it was surreal. At the end of everything, he could see people he recognized. Obviously, seeing the same Obi-Wan that defeated him wasn't pleasant, but at the end of everything, he saw Padme. Vader went deeper and further back through what he had seen. He felt everything all at once, the memories of the visions he languished over for so many days before he became Vader. But instead of visions, they were moments happening in real time. Some Ford says that the children could have very distinct memories as infants, and Leia was one of those children. He could see Padme. She was as beautiful as ever, but she was filled with sadness. She didn't live for very long, but Leia was introduced to her mother before being whisked away, where not long after, Padme died. Vader felt so many emotions as he came back to the present. Anger, pain, rage, certainly among them, but regret, confusion, and disgust too. How did Padme have children? According to Palpatine, she had died. Vader always took Sidious' word at face value, and now he was regretting the last 20 years of his life. Was it possible that Padme secretly lived, and had been orchestrating this entire rebellion? She was close with Bail and Mon Mothma, both of which were apparently super intertwined with the Alliance. This gave the Anakin Skywalker within Darth Vader hope that he might be able to reunite with his wife. Without having any information or confirmation that she was alive, it was a singular hope that made Anakin seemingly teeter between light and dark for the first time in years. Though, how likely was it possible that Padme survived? Leia hadn't interacted with her biological mother in the years following that vision or memory. While he would assume that Bale and Brea were smart individuals, simply by keeping the secret, Vader knew that they wouldn't keep Padme from her child. Wait. Vader then realized something. There was another child. Did he have twins? If so, where was the other child at? These would have to be looked into later, but the fact that Padme gave birth to two children was an interesting feat alone. As Vader came down from his hope, anger took over, realizing that the chances are both Padme and the other child died long before they could get out of the medical facility. So every ounce of excitement and desire to teeter between light and dark vanished, and he descended even further into the dark side. Vader knew he had to confront Leia about these events and what she knew, so he stormed back towards her prison cell. Leia, on the other hand, was seeing the past of Anakin Skywalker. A lot of what she saw was his most dwelled on thoughts, some of them being the losses to Obi-Wan or losing Padme, as well as killing Jedi. She never saw Palpatine because to Vader, Palpatine wasn't the most important thing in the universe. Though as Leia went back, she had a realization herself, one that noted how this man, the one in the suit, seemed familiar with a face Leia only recognized in her dreams. She always assumed the woman from her dreams, the one dying in childbirth, was her original mother. So to that, if that woman was around Anakin and even Obi-Wan, then perhaps she was the mother, and that would make Vader her father. Both father and daughter came to the conclusion at around the same time, and it left Leia quickly running through ideas of how she could approach this. She didn't have too much time though. The doors opened up and Vader walked in. She didn't say a word like he did last time, stepping down into a seat and sitting. Vader's mind went blank, trying to find the words to say. How does one approach talking to their daughter for the first time? Did she pick up on it? Was he just imagining things? None of it made any sense, so they looked at each other emotionless for several minutes. Leia didn't know what was coming, but it did give her more time to strategize her approach. He spoke. He told her that he felt a connection within her mind one that tied her all the way back to a person he was before he wore the suit. He insisted that it was entirely possible he was her biological father. Leia's reaction didn't change and he continued forward. He suggested that if it were true, then there was potential for some sort of bond, one where they might become allies. Surely she wasn't fond of him, but if she gave him time, they could come together as father and daughter to take control of the galaxy. Leia's blank expression continued and she asked if this was an ultimatum. He nodded his head. If she didn't join, then there was nowhere for her to run. Vader incentivized the idea that they could depart from the Death Star once they arrived at their location. Leia nodded her head and seemed, in a way, excited for this. Hours later, father and daughter would leave relatively discreetly from the Death Star and head towards Mustafar and Vader's castle. All Vader said is that he planned on making sure Leia gave up the information. This really annoyed Tarkin, because Tarkin planned on blowing Alderaan to hell. Without Leia present, then doing so wouldn't be nearly as effective for him. However, because he wasn't so eager to blow Alderaan into splinters, he received a call from his Emperor, an Emperor who wasn't pleased at all with the location of the Death Star. Former Senator Bail Organa informed the Emperor of its arrival moments after Alderaan noticed it had a new moon. Palpatine told Tarkin to cease any and all movements. If he didn't, then he would face his wrath. Tarkin obeyed his Emperor and waited patiently. Had Leia still been present, he likely would have missed this call with the Emperor and would have blown Alderaan out of the system. While Tarkin was waiting for Palpatine's arrival, movement on Alderaan picked up. El Organa wasn't given any assurance from Palpatine. Well, he was, but he also wasn't buying it. After the apparent mining disaster on Jeddah and recent reports from the Battle of Scarif, he knew that this was the weapon. 
Raya immediately called for a mass evacuation from the system, which did raise eyebrows on the Death Star, but they weren't allowed to do anything about it. Technically speaking, Tarkin could, but he wasn't going to play that game with Palpatine. As chaos unfolded on the planet, Ben Kenobi and Luke Skywalker showed up, after traveling all the way from Tatooine. Han and Chewie received their payment and bounced. They saw the panic and had no intention of dying. Plus, the old man and the kid got to where they needed to be. Why stay? Bale was obviously surprised to see them, but they didn't have time. Raya and Bale put them into a private vessel. It was another Corellian Corvette, like the Tanta IV, and told them to wait. Luke was questioning everything going on around them, and Ben didn't have time to answer, but it seemed as if the Empire constructed something remarkably large. It would be a threat to the galaxy if the Alliance didn't stop it. Within the span of an hour, Brea had gotten most of her people off-world, so she and Bale got on board their vessel and left the system as well. Once on board, they departed to Tatooine, and then from there, they'd go to Yavin. It was a pleasant reunion for Bale and Obi-Wan. For Luke, it was confusing, but he was included in every conversation, except for one topic. Being that it had been so long since Obi-Wan and Bale spoke, they asked each other about the other child, neither having been trained in the Force and neither learning about their true lineage. They from there had to decide if they wanted to introduce the concept to Luke or not. Because Bale actually raised Leia, he knew that it'd be better to bring up the truth of their lineage to both of them together. However, considering Leia was missing, Bale thought it'd be best to tell them both at the same time. The biggest concern was finding Leia, which meant for Obi-Wan, he'd be searching for her once again. Across the stars on the planet of Mustafar, Leia arrived at her father's castle. She looked on in disgust, and felt the heat radiating off the surface. It wasn't nearly as hot as it once was, but the fires of Mustafar still burned. The planet was healing, a true reflection of the galaxy around it. Fires beginning to lay dormant, and embers taking over more than the fire once held. It wasn't going to sprout seas just yet, but the blueprints for change were already established on the planet. Leia looked at the massive structure in front of her as her father guided her forward, with his hand pressed gently against her shoulder. As they entered, he began speaking about the potential she had. If she joined him, then she could potentially become a powerful Sith. They could find her sibling, if they were still alive, and then they could become rulers of the galaxy. He couldn't see her face, but she suggested excitement and readiness to follow him along this path. Leia kept her eyes peeled for anything she could find, but she was as helpless as one could be in the situation. When they got to the top of the castle, he stood before his throne and told her what she needed to do to become as powerful as he was within the Force, the way for her to open up her abilities and become like him. Leia hadn't thought about the Force since Obi-Wan told her that it was like turning on a light in a dark room. She thought about that here. She knew that there was something different within her, and while her father's mind probe didn't quite waken these abilities, his determination would help her access what had been hiding this entire time. At the same moment, Palpatine landed inside the Death Star and asked where Lord Vader was. The answer given by Tarkin was surprising to say the least, but he was alright with it. He could deal with Vader's insolence later. Abandoning his post wasn't like him, but if Vader could get Leia to break, then perhaps there'd be no reason to hand him a punishment. Freya, Bell, Luke, and Ben arrived at Yavin 4 to see the regrouped rebels. They were currently preparing for a counterattack on the Death Star, having had the plans for the super weapon since Bale abandoned Alderaan. They knew everything they needed to do. General Syndulla was able to show up as well, fresh after having given birth to Jason Syndulla and ready to lead another attack on the Empire. Bell broke off from Obi-Wan to talk with the other leaders of the Alliance that were present or speaking to each other through holograms. It wasn't widely supported as a mission, especially with the loss of Admiral Raddus and several freedom fighters at Scarif, but it was believed, especially by Bale, that right now, the Alliance needed to show its strength. Going back into hiding would only allow the Empire to grow stronger, suggesting they imagine a galaxy where the Death Star was surrounded by an impenetrable fleet, one where the Death Star could destroy any target it wanted, where billions could die within seconds, and no one would be willing to stand up to this oppression. He put that imagery into their minds, and the fear of letting such a power rise and stay in command was enough to force the Alliance leaders to either unite with those on Yavin or fall back and avoid the conflict altogether. Luke wanted to join the Rebels, and luckily, there was a free X-Wing for him to use, and a call sign that was left open after the Battle of Scarif. Red 5 would be his calling card, and he would join the rest of the pilots as he prepared to jump to light speed. They'd be going from Yavin to Alderaan to fight a base the size of a moon. If they could accomplish this task, then perhaps the Rebels would strike up resistance for more individuals willing to fight, but too afraid to at the moment. Before the Rebels left Yavin, Obi-Wan gave some advice to Luke about trusting the Force and using it during his mission. There would come a time when he would have to use the Force, and when that time came, he needed to trust it. Luke was obviously unsure about just trusting something like the Force in a moment as large as this, but he listened. With the Rebels aware of Galen Erso's little trick, they were ready to strike the Empire with vengeance. After the Rebels left, Rhea, Bell, and Obi-Wan spoke about what could have become of Leia. Obi-Wan clearly didn't know, 
but they were going to try and get to the bottom of it so that they could save her. Raya was obviously worried about her people, but because they evacuated the planet, there are more rumors circulating outwards from Alderaan about the super weapon that was about to be used on the core world. It made people reconsider the rumors of the mining disaster at Jeddah, and consider the reality of the Empire actually using a planet-killing technology on loyal citizens of the Empire. This elicited mixed reactions from the public, but it certainly made a lot of people worried about how far the Empire could take the suppression. The key mistake Palpatine continued to make as he implemented harsher rules against the people of the galaxy was the effectiveness of hope. If he gave people hope, he could control their destiny. He could let them feel like there was a way out of their predicament, but because there was no hope provided by the Empire, the people of the galaxy had to find it for themselves. Regardless, Bale and Brea theorized that Leia was with Vader. According to the few survivors who left Scarif long after the Alliance routed from the battle, noted that Vader's flagship was seen following the Tantive Four. They of course could assume that she was taken to the Death Star, but with an attack going to the planet-killing weapon, they simply needed to hope that she wasn't on it. Despite how much they loved their daughter, they couldn't risk her life over the billions that called Alderaan home, and even with the planet evacuated, that truth stood. They knew where the weapon was, if it left Alderaan, it would be harder for them to track it down so they could stop it. With hope that Leia was alive, Bray and Bale asked that Obi-Wan do them one final mission, one that Obi-Wan had no issue completing for them, find Leia and bring her home. The Inquisitors were gone, but if Vader wasn't, the best place to search for him was at his castle, the one that allegedly been built on Mustafar. Obi-Wan knew that going to Mustafar would likely kill him. He was slower and Vader would be fiercer, but if that was where she was, he needed to go. The future was more important than the longevity of his own life. So taking a squad of rebel elite commandos, Obi-Wan left for Mustafar. It wasn't a guarantee that Leia would be there, but if Vader was, then perhaps it could kill him. No one knew that the Emperor had left Coruscant for the Death Star, but if either mission was successful, it could be detrimental for the Empire, especially with the Senate having only recently been disconstructed. On Mustafar, Vader was talking with Leia, in full belief that she was with him. Though it seemed like it was true, it probably was too. Leia was taking up a massive interest in what he was spouting off to her about. Force this, darkness that. It was a loop that went on, on, and on, and on. But Leia was patient. She was stubborn, but she was patient enough to listen to him. She was honestly becoming more and more disenchanted with the fact that this was her actual father. She didn't know the circumstances of which her mother died, but she was starting to think that he had a part of it. It wasn't like he said something for her to get this thought. For Leia, like it usually was with her, it was a feeling. She listened to what he had to say, and honestly for her, it was just too brooding. The idea that someone would intentionally commit themselves to a life of misery was just beyond her. Trying to always find the worst in anything, or how about everything? She wasn't just disappointed, but she was disgusted. Vader saw everything in such a polarized way, and his hopes were that Leia would be able to rise to a level he could have possessed had he not lost to Obi-Wan. What made matters worse for Leia is that it became readily apparent that she wouldn't be able to do anything to get away. She was initially hoping that she could use this as a way to escape, and now that she was trapped on Mustafar with no one in the galaxy knowing where she was, she wouldn't be able to get out. She had to play the game with Vader, but how long could she sound interested? Vader was able to get a DNA sample and a midichlorian count, all of which confirming that she was a daughter of Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala. As father and daughter were adjusting to the new knowledge, and Vader was trying to get her to turn to the dark side, the Alliance arrived outside of hyperspace over Alderaan. The Emperor was welcomed into his technological terra known as a Death Star by Tarkin. Upon their reunion, Palpatine had his royal guards dispose of the longtime ally. Sidious knew the truth regarding Tarkin. He had way too much influence, and because of that influence, he was a threat to the Emperor, especially without the Imperial Senate. Part of Palpatine's reasoning for this was the fact that Tarkin killed Krennic without anyone batting an eye. His influence and power was far too great for a regular Imperial officer to have. Now that he was no longer an issue, Palpatine planned on moving the Death Star away from Alderaan. Despite his desire to show strong Imperial presence, Tarkin was foolish for placing the Death Star outside of a prestigious core world. However, before they could get the engines churring for the jump to hyperspace, the Alliance showed up. This made Palpatine even more disgruntled, but they needed to defend their super station. The assault in the air was being led by General Sundula, with a number of other survivors from the Battle of Scarif who had optimal time to prepare for this assault. With the ghosts present, the Alliance would have one hell of a time making the day miserable for the Empire. Inside the command center on Yavin, orders were being relayed to the Alliance fighters as they dove down into the trenches that lined the exterior of the Death Star. The fight began in waves of Imperial TIE fighters broke out of their hangar bays to engage the rebels. General Sindula was able to use her vessel as a distraction, which worked brilliantly. With war criminal chopper Zeb and Captain Rex manning the cannons on the ghost, 
they were able to lay down heavy ordnance against the TIE fighters. Luke followed along with Red Squadron and Gold Squadron as they dove through the trenches and searched for the exhaust port. The battle was tense, but the Alliance made do with everything they had. General Sundula was able to thwart any and all ace pilots that came up to stop the rebels. The siege didn't take long, but the Empire and the Emperor were left surprised by the effectiveness of both the Alliance and the first-time X-Wing pilot Luke Skywalker, who fired the shot that obliterated the superweapon. The superweapon was destroyed as the Alliance made their escape. The rebels were victorious as they made their return to Yavin 4. On Mustafar, a rebel transport landed at the landing pad at Vader's castle. Obi-Wan told the troopers inside the group that their only objective was getting Leia off-world. If they got her to the transport before he got back, they needed to leave. They were not to wait for him because if they did, it could cost them all their lives. The commandos understood their orders and they left the vessel they arrived in. The commandos broke off from Kenobi as they scaled the interior of the castle. Vader felt Obi-Wan's presence which led him to telling Leia to wait for him in his chambers. Ben could feel Vader's attention towards him and so he walked out to the front of the castle, a place that looked over the same lava waterfall that Vader lost all of his limbs next to. Ben stood, looking over a place he hadn't seen in 20 years, waiting for that dark presence to arrive. He could feel Vader getting closer and as he turned around, he looked into the mask of the Dark Lord. Vader marched forward and ignited his weapon, telling his former master that he came all the way back here to die. Leia joined the dark side, he lost, and the future belonged to him. Ben ignited his lightsaber and told Vader that his focus on darkness would be his very undoing. Vader didn't think so. He believed that with Leia joining him, he would be unstoppable. He could destroy his master and take over the galaxy. The former master and apprentice engaged. The fires had died down since their last duel on this planet. Ben and Vader were slow upon the beginning of their engagement. They were each testing each other out. While Ben was able to defeat Maul not more than two years beforehand, this would be different. Vader wouldn't be arrogant enough to do what he did the last time they fought. Ben's great hope was that the commandos could get to Leia and escape this desolate land. As the duel was continuing forward, they both stopped momentarily. Vader and Ben turned to each other and backed off. Something was wrong. Something happened. Vader recognized it as the death of his master, but Obi-Wan could feel millions of lives that were on the Death Star vanish into nothingness. The two opponents kept their distance as the force began to waver due to the mass amounts of death. Inside the castle, the commanders were able to kill the Royal Guard stationed inside the facility and get Leia out. As they made their escape, Leia asked where Ben was, and the rebel vessel pulled around to the side of the castle where Obi-Wan and Vader were as they engaged again. As the two duelists continued their fight with each other, the U-Wing fighter pulled up and hovered away from the fight. The bay doors opened and Leia called out to Ben, telling him to come over to her now, they could save him. Obi-Wan looked back over her shoulder and then back to Vader, who was confused and heartbroken. He assumed that Leia was all into joining the dark side, like how could she not want to stay here against her will and join him? Leia pulled a blaster from one of the commanders and started opening fire at Vader. He blocked the shots as Obi-Wan swung his blade forward, hitting Vader's blade again. Leia called out to Obi-Wan again, but he turned back with a smile, both calm and reassuring. Vader was going to try and bring the U-Wing out of the sky. Vader yelled back, telling the crew to fire on the platform. Of course, this would mean the death of both Obi-Wan and Vader, but truthfully, it was a better fate than allowing Vader to take control over the Empire. Leia tried to get the pilots to not listen, but Obi-Wan got his way, with a grin and then getting Vader's attention away from the U-Wing. Re-engaging in their duel, throwing his blade against Vader's before being pushed back as the platform descended. As it slipped, Obi-Wan slashed across the upper part of Vader's chest and armor, assuming that the suit was armor-resistant to fire. The platform began to slip more and more. Obi-Wan turned back to Leia with a smile as Vader's lights was driven into his stomach. Kenobi turned back and grabbed the back of Vader's helmet and told him it was done. The two of them fell down into the lava river below, both of them consumed by the magma, ending their brotherhood right where it was destroyed originally. Leia was in tears as the ship pulled away, but she knew that Ben's sacrifice would be one that could reshape the galaxy for the better. The Yingling pilot pulled away from Mustafar and departed for Yavin. Both Leia and the squads that attacked the Death Star would return around the same time. There would of course be a massive celebration for the victory the Alliance heralded in. However, as great as their victory may have been, there is much work that needs to be done. Bail Organa departed before Leia returned, to make a stance on Coruscant. There were rumors circulating that the Emperor died over Alderaan, and if it was indeed true, then he needed to capitalize off of it. With Bail gone, it was up to Brad to explain the situation surrounding Luke and Leia's lineage and how they were twins, separated from birth and raised in two different locations. Obviously, that was a lot to swallow, but they took the information in and adapted to it. Bail eventually arrived at Coruscant and would try and bring together a collective voice. It wouldn't work. Most of the senators had gone away, so Bail did what he could, using evidence from Alderaan, Jeddah, and Scarif. He didn't paint the Alliance as villains, rather heroes. 
It had been so long since anyone stood out openly against the Emperor, but with Palpatine and Vader gone, there was a chance to turn the entire system on its head. There was no one to oppose him, aside from military leaders. With major leaders in Tarkin and Krennic gone, the Empire looked to be weak, but it wouldn't be. Despite the hope that came from Bale's message, the Empire came together stronger than ever before. The destruction of the Death Star and the death of Palpatine did two major things. It united the Alliance and it pushed more people to join the cause, as well as it was being used to bring more people to the side of the Empire, using the deaths of millions of workers and troopers as a rallying cry for all new recruits and systems. What came from this was much more than rebellion versus Empire, but a more galactic scale war. Systems that were teetering on loyalty towards the Empire saw how fragile the system was and took advantage of it. The mounting up of the Alliance-based forces and Imperial forces pushed both sides into a much larger conflict. The largest reasoning for this was the death of Palpatine, and with a reason to fight, with hope, the Rebels were able to gather more allies than ever seen before. Though the most important of these allies would be the Mon Calamari, joining the fight after the sacrifice of Admiral Radis at the Battle of Scarif. The addition of the Mon Cala meant that the Rebels finally got their hands on a formidable fleet that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Empire. Mon Cala vessels had better shields than anything in the Imperial arsenal. What followed in the coming months would be strikes and riots, resembling those from Rakina V. While military was a large part of the Imperial strength, once important products and materials became unavailable, it forced everyone, especially in the Empire, to become uncomfortable. These strikes grinding the entire Imperial system to a halt, forcing Imperial officers to force harsher regulations, martial law, and open executions for defiance. Without Palpatine ruling over the Empire, officers and moths, especially, took a hold of the Empire and split it up amongst themselves. This wasn't an act of retaliation against the other, more so keeping the peace between rival moths and officers within the Empire, though this quickly defined the war against the Empire as one between the commoners and the elite of the galaxy, one where the people collectively saw the oppressive rule of their Emperor fall apart, because without Palpatine the entire system was nothing. Leia and Luke had an important role in this, being the freedom fighters of their generation. A generation that never saw the Clone Wars. One that just like Jin Erso and Ezra Bridger, had to fight an enemy that existed since they were too young to know how evil the Empire truly was. While the Force Ghost of Ben Kenobi wouldn't make himself known to them, they joined Harris and Nula and the rest of the Ghost crew to fight against the Empire. With Han and Chewie vanishing back into the smuggling world, the Ghost crew was extremely accepting of the two Skywalkers. Due to the worker strikes and so forth, Imperial projects like the second Death Star and Superstar Dreadnoughts could not be finished, let alone be started. The collective will of the galaxy forced the Empire into a box, and while the fight would last for seven more years, without the influence of the Sith, the slow destruction of the Empire would crush any determination for an Imperial Remnant or First Order. The long drawn out war pushed even diehard Imperial loyalists to a breaking point. Most of them either died in combat, or deserted before the resounding Alliance victories at Kuwat, Anaxis, and Coruscant. After those planets fell, there was no one to resist the rise of the Alliance. By this point, seven years after the Battle of Alderaan, Leia and Luke were finishing their Jedi training and beginning to move into what could only be a new era of Jedi for the galaxy. Bell and Mon Mothma would work together, again, as longtime allies to restructure the Empire into a new Republic one that dismantled an imperial regime and brought forth new order to the galaxy. While Palpatine's death was certain over Alderaan, the rise of his clone, Snoke, would come at a very quick end nearly two decades later. Without a strong loyalty to the Empire, it didn't take much. Thanks to Leia and Luke finding Ochi a Bastoon before he crashed and died on Pasana, they were able to find Exgol and finish off what they started years beforehand. While neither Skywalker twin would have children, the legacy would live through this new generation of Jedi, as the galaxy moved into an era of peace not seen since before the Clone Wars. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William 1767, Darth Revan, Granddaddy Bane, Cullen Rooney, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Woo 670, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Naguan, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kallik, Yelling Slayer 66, and then Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Photos Exley Star Wars, Airbus, Rex the Wolf, The Mammoth Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash the like button if you want to support me in other ways. Patreon is available down below. Sith Clone Wars every Saturday, like this Saturday, where we see Delta Squad on Endor. Anyways, I'm not feeling well, so I'm just gonna say I thought this was fun to have like three main characters or three events going on at the same time, most of our Alderaan Yavin. That was a lot of fun. This was a fun video to do. I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends. May the Force be with you.